today's event and to introduce a colleague of mine, former colleague, uh, the head of E3G in London, Nick. I, I, I was very happy to work with E3G with my other colleague, Johnson Gavanta, who's here uh, for a number of years recently on, on European energy policy, but was always hugely impressed with Nick Maybe, who's an amazing, uh, um, I think, insight as to what's happening in the political system and applying it to particularly climate uh, and energy issues, where he's had a long-held interest going back into, uh, well, going back right back to MIT, I suppose, originally in terms of energy systems analysis. Alstrom, he went, he went astray. Um, World Wildlife Foundation, he was World Wildlife Foundation, he was found again, and then Foreign Office and, and Number Ten in London, and as I said, for the last must be ten years in E3G, eleven years, eleven now. years in E3G. So I think we're very lucky to have him here. It's a very interesting and a time to have his perspective on some of the um, climate change issues in relation to Brexit and our future of Europe. Oh, thanks very much and thanks so much for inviting me here. I think it's the second time I've spoken here. The first time I, I spoke here was the first time I met Eamon um, and when we kind of dragged him into doing some interesting politics around Europe. Um, Eamon mentioned in my history that I kind of took a detour working in the nuclear industry. I actually wasn't working in the nuclear industry, though I was working in the nuclear industry. I thought I was working in the only UK firm that produced wind turbines at the time I graduated from college as a, as a mechanical engineer. Um, then I found out that the wind turbine we were building was a three megawatt wind turbine on Orkney, and the partners in the wind turbine were BAE Systems, a nuclear firm, and um, Rolls-Royce. And that's when I realized the reason we were doing that when the Danes were building 500 kilowatt wind turbines um, was that the Department of Energy wanted us to come up with the most expensive wind turbine ever built. So they could prove definitively that wind power had no future in the UK and the only future was coal and nuclear. That's when I started to stop doing engineering and started doing politics, so, <laughs> which kind of sums up my whole, my whole journey. Um, I wish in some ways I'd graduated at the time I could have carried on building huge monstrosities in the North Sea that were drowned, but um, you don't get to organise the times you live in, and uh, that's why at E3G we do a lot of work trying to connect politics and policy, and this is obviously the role of Brexit in energy and climate change is pretty much one of the biggest pieces of politics and policy out there. So before I start, I'll just introduce E3G so you know who we are. So we're a non-profit. We have offices in London, Brussels, Berlin, and Washington, um, but we work kind of half in Europe and half outside Europe. We'll focus on accelerating the transition to sustainable development, but real kind of climate change is our core, our core business, but really looking at the difficult social and political and um, regulatory transitions. Um, we're working with a range of organizations in Brussels, um, and Jonathan leads that work, he's here as well. Um, on the negotiations, but also on the future of Europe, so the link between that shifting, how all of this changes Europe going forward. But we're also working in the UK with a set of environmental NGOs and others on called Greener UK that are trying to make sure that the UK side is run well. So on kind of both sides of the channel, we see both sides of the conversation. Um, I think we're trusted on both sides of the conversation, but we'll see how that goes during the negotiations. And um, just because everybody always asks, what uh, work we do is supported by foundations, mainly a um, mixture of European and UK foundations. So what are the kind of core messages from the work we've been doing um, since the referendum, really, since the fateful day afterwards, we thought, what does this mean for us? Well, the first one is we think that EU27 is much too complacent about the outcome of Brexit on the interests, the future security and prosperity of Europeans, that they've just think it's something that happens over there and it isn't really going to touch them. Um, but we definitely think Europe can't afford an uncooperative Brexit, which can occur in several different ways. Because the chances of a deregulatory state in the UK are incredibly high for lots of structural political reasons, which we'll doubtless discuss. And if that happens, it will massively chill the development of an inclusive, high-quality Europe, and also lower Europe's ability to shape the world for Europeans, that ability to project power and influence. And of course, it will also give immediate costs, and the country most affected by those immediate costs will be Ireland, as you all know so well, and the front page of the papers today say so eloquently about how much um, public revenue will be lost. Um, the world has changed, um, and we'll go through these detailed scenarios we've been doing for the last year. Um, 
when after the elections we see the scenarios kind of polarized now between a kind of more cooperative soft outcome and actually a complete crash and it, with nothing much in between and we go through why that is um, and it's a mixture of the kind of chaos in the UK plus the failure to get a mandate for a hard Brexit and we really think that in order to move us towards a more likely cooperative soft Brexit outcome and perhaps even a change of hearts in the UK that's, we'll talk about that that energy and climate change is a great place to build cooperation. We need to have dynamic cooperation. There's a lot of win-win activities we need to do, um, and that can be a way of doing it. And Ireland has a specific role to play in championing a more cooperative politics inside the EU27 um, because of its unique space, voice, um, and position in negotiations. So that's the kind of general message. Um, so the first piece, why do we think... Europe is complacent about Brexit. Well, part of it's the good news. You know, the mojo is back. Macron is back. The populists are defeated. Everything's fine. Well, it's not everything's fine. Everything's going better than it was. And the idea of Europe cracking up into chaos is seen as a much lower likelihood in the next few years. Though, obviously, in Paris, it's we've got five years to defeat the populists. It's a basic line, and we need to make some big changes. But still, that means that the um, political attention in Berlin, in Paris, in Brussels is really focused on the Eurozone reforms. It's focused on the offer to the left behind. It's focused on dealing with Trump, dealing with China. If you follow the latest EU-China summit, good on climate, still bad on difficult on trade, and the relationship between two, you know, Europe's got to act like a proper geostrategic power now, and it's not, you know, it's still getting its head around how to do that without the UK. And of course, this is embodied in a future of Europe process that's about to kick off and will really in earnest start in December. Um, and it's because they think, yeah, and rightly, that the economic costs of a disorderly crash Brexit will fall mostly on the UK. Um, and basically, that would be a good thing to discourage others to go. So if your main issue is discouraging others, and that's still, especially in Brussels, is the main thing people think about, um, then that's good. And the kind of political chaos in the UK is an object lesson. If even a stable politically stable country like the UK. It doesn't feel that stable when you live in it. But anyway, from the outside, it's the narrative. So, that, so basically, the harder the better. It's a little bit, and it's, I was talking to a, a colleague in Paris, and she said, rationally, they know that's not true, but this is emotional. This is about, you know, there's an emotional piece here, which is still quite strong because of the resentment of the divorce vote. But as I said before, it underestimates the cost of having a very large economy just offshore from Europe, which is focused on aligning with the US and Australia and others, and using deregulation as a major force of competitiveness, which will fail. And therefore, they'll double down on it. They won't say, we're not going to do more deregulation. You know, there, there's a long way you can go down that line if there's a lack of cooperation. And really, I think people underestimate on the continent the strength of that faction of the Conservative Party and their supporters in the right-wing press. I mean, it's the Daily Mail, it's the Telegraph, it's the Express. They're the major right-wing tabloids and broadsheets, and they're very vocal about this. Even after the tragic fire, the Grenfell fire, their headline was, did EU regulations cause this blaze? And it was absolutely repulsive. That's their first thought. Can we blame EU regulations for everything? So... And I just don't think people understand how much sway they have in a particular part of the party. And they're already preparing for this. You know, the key objective of this faction in the UK is to do trade deals with other countries. And they're already looking at how to harmonize around chlorinated chicken and beef hormone, treated beef, with the US and Australia. So the first three deals they want to do are US, Australia, New Zealand. Agriculture will be key. What's that do to Ireland? and Ireland's agricultural sector. What does the DUP think of that, we might ask? Doesn't seem to fit their version of Brexit, but that's the, that is the agenda live in Whitehall at the moment. So, too complacent. So, where are we going into? So, this is the structure, you know this, you know, phase one. Phase zero, the negotiations about negotiations, that took around two minutes. We are expecting that to take a little longer after David Davis was so baroque in his um, idea. So we're in phase one, you know, citizens' money in Ireland, and at some point there will be a decision that that's going well, and we'll move into phase two, the future relationship, which people start talking about the future relationship, and then they turn it into a discussion of trade and investment and services, and all the other bits of our future relationship seem to, to drop off. And that the sometime, you know, 
there will be a conclusion of a withdrawal agreement and the end of the and the kind of some some indeterminate point because we want to finish the trade relations, but we'll have some kind of MOU or principles where you know nothing's agreed till everything's agreed, but we're not quite sure what that means. That's, but anyway, so that, they can sort that out. That's not too difficult. You know, Barnier said it's a two plus two, two years withdrawal, two years trade. Um, I think Hammond said two plus four yesterday. Um, Two plus seven might be more realistic. Um, who knows? Um, but somewhere in that, in that range. But the critical thing for us when we look at this is, when do you discuss areas where we need to carry on cooperating, whether that's security, whether that's environment, whether that's climate change, whether that's energy, whether that's digital, places where the world is moving on, where staying the same or a little less than the same, like a tariff, isn't good enough, where we actually need to cooperate to do win-wins. And it's just... Doesn't like there's anywhere there. So the, if we're doing two plus two and then do these things, or are they going to be bundled in? So where do we actually do the issues, which for us we feel are at least as important economically and probably more important in terms of health and welfare and prosperity and security than some of the issues being looked at in the trade area, given the low level of tariffs bound in under WTO, which are already there. So priorities and. For energy and climate, of course, this is happening at a very busy time. I won't go through all the different processes, but we're doing a lot of stuff on energy and climate at the same time as Brexit. But particularly, we're re-engineering the whole of the EU energy economy and transport economy and financial economy um, and the budget, which will be changed by Brexit. Um, and they'll have to put a new offer forward in 2020 to put Paris back on track. Now we've decided we're defenders of Paris. We can't say back. And then pretty much straight after that, in the same commission with the same parliament, we will have the global stock take in 2023, where we have to put our 2040 target on the table to be finalised in 2025. So that is pretty much one political moment in the same time frame as the Brexit stroke future agreement, where we will determine the 2040 trajectory and offer of the EU, and that pretty much determines what temperature we get to live with globally. So if we can't, as Europe, put a strong proposition forward how likely is it that China and India and others will? Or will we end up with three degrees? What do we think of that? Or two and a half? You know, pick your number, but it ain't going to be well below two, and it's certainly not going to be 1.5. So Paris fails at that point, inside which Brexit is going on in parallel with all these changes. So that's why we say for energy and climate change, the crash Brexit would be incredibly damaging. So first, distraction. At the same time as doing this, and especially if we... We have a very uncooperative process and we're dealing with clearing up mess. The idea that um, it will both empower low ambition forces in Poland and its silent allies in certain industries and certain other countries to do less, but also weaken European diplomatic capacity. UK has 145 full-time climate diplomats. The European Commission has 1.5. Germany has around six. So, you know, having a good relationship on climate diplomacy with the UK really helps, as well as in global influence. We don't want the UK veering towards a Trumpist or post-Trump, to be honest, US, which will still be split on climate change and not a real leader on climate action, um, because it hasn't got a good relationship with Europe. Um, deregulation, a race to the bottom. We need to stop that. How do we make sure we've got rules that stop that race to the bottom, especially if you're in Ireland? Um, disruption to markets, you know, Ireland becoming an energy island. If we haven't got rules to have a seamless internal market, particularly in electricity, it's going to be very hard to respond to the energy revolution that's going on at the moment, just as we're accelerating the growth of renewables and just when things like offshore wind are dropping radically in price and are starting to become cost competitive with any other alternative, but can only be deployed at real penetration scale inside an integrated, um, at least you know, sub-regional scale grid, if not a continental scale grid. You, know, you need that to make it work. Otherwise, it doesn't become feasible. Disentanglement. If the UK drops out, we have to open up the European 2030 target. Have to rearrange burdens. Does Europe actually put forward a lower target in 2020, like Trump will, was going to do? That? So we do, a, we do a US. So you know, what's the consequences of dropping out? So the UK is drafting an ETS bill, even though it wasn't in the Queen's speech. It's drafting an autarkic climate policy, which is not connected to Europe. And deferral of investment. You know, until people know how they're going to be integrated together, will they actually put money on the table for significant investments? 
until they know how the European budget is going to work, how the EIB is going to work, uh, the market. So on all of these areas, of course, um, even under the best agreement, some of these will come in. But under a crash agreement, all of these will be in a very bad sense. So, so where are we now? What, are the, what is the kind of state of play in terms of the way the EU sees this? Um, so we've got some good things. Barnier has said repeatedly in private and public that he wants to have a strong clause on not rolling back environmental standards. Um, however, in CETA and TTIP, that was non-binding. It was non-justiciable, though there's a new court ruling that may change that. But so fine. But actually how binding is going to be in the final agreement when this is a real demand from the UK, the hardliners, they want to have the flexibility to do this because they want to align with other people's trade agreements. Um, no cherry picking. So there seems to be a bundling of the internal energy market with the internal market as a, well, it's not a thing. It's a name for a lot of things, a lot of treaties. And so, no, you can't cherry pick sectors. That's the, new, that's the line. But again, you know, there is a revolution in energy and digital systems, which means we are integrated physically and we need to evolve with the integration of technology. It's a technological fact. We have to work together because we are physically connected and getting deeper connected in that way. Um, the political importance of EU climate leadership has risen with Merkel and Macron particularly coming out vis-a-vis -vis Trump. They've got to back that up. If they mess this up, they won't be able to back up their rhetoric with action. So that should impinge on European prioritization. Um, by 2030, at an aggregate level, Europe gets to 50% of renewables in the power sector, and the UK and others will be further down that path. You just can't do that without integrating at the regional level. And in the end, there's an out. Well, the energy has never been a classic internal market system. We have lots of different arrangements with countries like energy community outside the EU. And so if we want to carve it out, and call it special, it is special. It's a different bit of the treaty. It has different structures around it. It's not the same as trade, competence legal-wise. So there's no need to bundle it together to avoid cherry-picking. But, you know, it's unclear. Those are good arguments to make it different, but Barnier, to us anyway, has been unclear in terms of where he sees cooperation fitting in the negotiations. And this issue of you know, punishment and integrity, is this just a chip in a bigger game of making U UK feel the pain? Well, if it makes Ireland feel lots and lots of pain, perhaps it should be lower down on the list of instruments to use to enforce that particular negotiating objective. The problem is we're not having a public debate about those priorities in Europe. It's as if it's all done in Barnier's head. Well, that's obviously not good enough. There should be a public debate about in which areas um, you make leaving the EU look like a bad thing. I mean, obviously, UK politics is an object lesson of why you shouldn't try and leave Europe. But um, you know, I think it's really uh, you know, the absence of that public debate is really stifling the discussion. We are not negotiators. Barnier has to say certain things. He's a negotiator. But we can have a political discussion around the negotiations, which thinks about these things. Whereas sometimes it feels like, it's like, no, you're not allowed to speak because that will undermine the European negotiating hand. Well, I just don't, I don't believe that. And I don't think it's healthy for democracy and for 21st century diplomacy to say people in, in, in closed rooms will determine the future. And I think TTIP showed what happens when you try and run a 21st century diplomacy um, process that imp impacts people's what they eat, what they breathe, where they go to work, and then try and run it like an old classic 19th century process where you just trust the negotiators go away for six months and come back with a deal. Um, so jumping in, so we've done a lot of work on scenarios around Brexit, thinking through how they work, and we've, and I'll show you the kind of how we've labelled it. So we've looked at kind of four core drivers. The first one is how are people prioritising national interest? We've done quite a lot of work, particularly energy and climate, looking at the national interest um, different countries. Secondly, you know, orderly versus disorderly negotiating processes. This is not always what you want, but um, the negotiations are so complex. The UK is so disorganized. Um, just trying to run this, even with goodwill, is hard. And as the Copenhagen negotiations showed us in climate change, you know, things can just fall over because they're too complicated. And the geometry of the negotiations can determine things which um, political outcomes. The third one is the time and extent of economic impacts. How wealthy do people feel, particularly in the UK at certain points, How's that going to change? That's going to be a lot of this is what forces come together at what time relative to the negotiations. Again, it might not be your intent. You have to live with the economics and politics you've got. And then um, 
the last one is what's the momentum coming out of the Article 50 withdrawal negotiations? Are we hating each other and static, or is it, you know, we've done a quick deal with lots of goodwill and we got half and you know, kind of on the way to moving forward? So how that's gone, which is, again, um, a mixture of tactics playing into strategy. So those are the areas we've looked at. And this is where we kind of plot them out. We have a y-axis between orderly and disorderly. We think that's really important, that how things are playing. And then we have a x-axis of corporation interests dominate, and on the other one, sovereignty and integrity for the EU interests dominate. So that's the kind of playing field. And we identify kind of three stroke four kind of core blobs of where we think things can land up depending on the dynamics. They don't overlap because they're driven by very different forces. Um, at the bottom, there's the EU in chaos outcome, which is very disorderly, driven from the EU side. Remember, we started writing these last year. Um, and basically, integrity and sovereignty is not completely dominant, but pretty dominant. So that's a kind of, that was one outcome. At the top right, we have kind of economic transition. That's a cooperation interest dominate. It's an orderly process. We try and do you know, the best deal we can. Obviously, there's a range of outcomes that you can get in that, but it's generally we're trying to get a good outcome, and we have a process that lets us go through it. Um, and then on the other side, we have um, a blob that has two poles. One is uh, the sovereign transition, which is, you know, Europe prioritizes integrity, UK prioritizes sovereignty. Um, it tries to run an orderly process and kind of like quite tough battles. David Davis is in there being kind of, I'm going to make a row in the summer. Um, that's, you know, but that can drop down into hostile nationalism, particularly because that's where you play tactical games to your own audience and say, aren't they bad? They're not looking in good faith. And so it's a bit of a slippery slope. And so when we, in February 2017, that's where we thought the scenario was. That's for May's negotiating position. We thought the dominant scenario was they'll try and do sovereign transition, particularly from the UK side, with a very high risk of dropping into hostile nationalism. And I won't go through this in detail, but you can just look from the red for energy and climate change on all of the indicators and benchmarks we use, um, not very good, either for the UK on the left or the EU on the right. More reds for the UK, but still not a very good outcome, and particularly if it crashes out. Um, and as I say, there's a paper you can read all of this. Um, so what's changed? So we just updated the scenarios. They've just been put on the website. So after the UK and French elections, so what have we, what have we seen? Well, positive move on national interests. We think there's a kind of stronger view towards cooperation. Macron's come forward. People are feeling... Um, more confident. UK election result means business voice will be stronger. There's, you know, the Remainers were seen to have kind of pushed against the hardest of Brexit outcomes. So positive, positive on that line. Orderly versus disorderly, on the other hand, gone the other way. The ability of the UK to hold a negotiating position and particularly to do a final deal at heads level when the normal negotiations break down, because this will not be solved at the, at the negotiator level has dropped off massively because there is no consensus in any party on what Brexit UK wants. There just isn't. That's just a fact. So who knows what Brexit will pop out? So the likelihood of um, disorderly negotiations has gone up. Um, economic impacts, mixed, but we're seeing them hit in, but not real, a real change from what we were expecting. We we're expecting that to, you know, negative economic impacts to roll through pretty much as they are now. And momentum... Coming out, we think, yeah, it's kind of mixed as well. Not, not a huge change um, going forward. Perhaps if we updated it after the recent meeting, we'd say a bit, bit more positive because they've not argued over the agenda. So how does that change what we think is likely in dominant scenarios? It's, it's very strange. We think that the UK can't do a sovereign transition anymore. It's lost that mandate. So the actual, that space has gone. That's why that blob has gone down. We think EU and chaos is, is off the table for the next few years. Yeah, we may be proved wrong, but... We're taking a fact that that's a unlike, very unlikely event now. So we're now stuck in two polarised scenarios, a solid, orderly, kind of economic interest-driven approach and a disorderly, populist-driven, hostile nationalist approach, like a crash Brexit. So, you know, kind of either one or the other. And the question is, which one are we going to go for and how do we try and get further up that side? And again, I won't go through the detail, but we've done analysis of what hostile nationalism means for energy and climate. Very bad for the UK, gets lots of reds. Still pretty bad for EU on all of our metrics. And particularly bad for 
Europe going into the next climate. I mean, climate is really, really bad because it just, you know, there won't be much. Um, much better if we get an orderly outcome, orderly cooperative outcome. So again, um, feel free to read through the detail. So quite big stakes, quite polarised outcomes. How do we make sure we're more likely to get on the cooperative outcome? And we think that's where Ireland, it's on our last slide, where Ireland can play a really critical role. So Ireland has the most to gain from the strong cooperation and not just on energy and climate, but on everything, um, and much to lose from a crash Brexit. I don't think there's much complacency here. So you're a bit of an outlier compared to certainly Paris and Berlin. Um, I wonder if Denmark and Sweden and others, what they think. We haven't gone, but we are planning to take this then to kind of get the temperature. Ireland is very well positioned to be an advocate for a negotiating approach that actually creates a clear space to do the cooperation. So it doesn't just leave it to chance um, or Barnier's whims to do it. Because you can blend, you've got an interest which is very hard-headed about the deregulatory side, so being tough in the lose-lose negotiations over trade relations. You know, those aren't much fun. They're not going to generate any wealth or value, but they need to be sorted out. But at the same time, in the kind of win-win areas where we need to strengthen future cooperation from where we are today. So this isn't about, you know, in climate change, we need stronger climate change cooperation, stronger energy than under current European rules. And that's what we were negotiating internally inside Europe. Um, a positive cooperation, a cooperative approach. And we think you could do this in four ways. Firstly, just making the case for it, just saying... If we want the politics to be shaped in the right way, we can't just talk about lose-lose all the time. We have to have some places where we are building this partnership. Um, and that's important for us. That's important for Europeans, and it's important for Ireland. So making that kind of principled national European case. Secondly, make sure these issues are dealt with positively in the first phase discussions about Ireland, because all of these issues will come up. Now, we're not quite sure when the timing of that is going to be, but it's something they will have to address in phase one on things like energy cooperation, etc. And it can't just be, again, a kind of border discussion. It's going to have to be about how we cooperate. Thirdly, start to build the coalition of other countries who care and who will start to move on. Again, trying to find who those people on the environment side, on cooperation and with different areas, and realise that if it's just a, a negative relationship, we could end up with something very bad. And also support business and think tanks talking about it like this. This is a way you, you surround negotiations with thinking. It's not all about negotiation. We haven't thought through all of the dynamics and the priorities of the Brexit negotiations. That should be a right debate, and it should be a debate with Europeans across all the countries, including the Europeans who live in the UK who have some interests and don't necessarily feel particularly represented by David Davis um, at the negotiating table. Um, and lastly, the potential, as we get into the second phase, to propose that climate energy then becomes a bit of an early harvest conf strategic confidence-building measure, very normal thing to do in big, complex negotiations. Say, let's show we can work together on these things. Let's work, we can work through arbitration and regulatory harmonisation in an area that is not politicised, where we've got very aligned goals, but there's lots of value to be created, and show we can do it, and then other things on the cooperative side can move forward, and that is a... And that's put in from the beginning, not waiting till after we've got totally bored of doing you know, customs deals and tariff negotiations and access for the City of London, and everybody's completely tired at the end. Um, and I think there's a particular issue at the end of phase one, which is about international obligations, where we have to decide if we're going to talk about UK being part and EU's commitment under the Paris Accord, which was taken together, and part of phase one is talking about ongoing international obligations. So again, there is a place in the current terms of reference to say, OK, how are we going to deal with this? This is big and important. It can't just be shoved in a side closet and left till later. We need to actually have a process for dealing with it. Um, and so we think if this is something Ireland can do, which would have a material impact in getting a better outcome, and again, not just in climate energy, but in shaping the whole frame of the negotiations, and particularly so that European citizens, this back to the future of Europe, that they think this, these talks are being done not to, in the interests of Siemens and um, you know, Goldman Sachs and others and trade-offs between you know, sectors and services and goods, because whatever they say, that's what the trade stuff will be about, but actually in the interests of what Europeans care about and what give Europeans direct welfare benefits, security benefits, prosperity benefits, because we don't want this to be TTIP too in terms of the relationship between a negotiation and European citizens, because then, one, it might fall over right at the end, which would be another way of getting crash Brexit, not getting ratification, 
But also, it would set up the new Europe, assuming UK does leave, in the wrong spirit from the beginning, in a spirit that had distrust at its core, rather than trust and a new social contract at its core, which for me is what the point of the future of Europe debate is all about, and this is critical to do it. Thank you very much.